Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. How have the world institutions, governments, non-governmental organizations, the private sector, everyone on planet Earth dealt with problems in the past, such as war and peace, economic and social development, and human rights? What type of agenda, new agenda, do we need for the future? My guest today is an expert on this issue. Today we're gonna to be talking about a very interesting book that uh, Diana Aiton Schinker has written. And Diana Aiton Schinker is the Global Catalyst Senior Fellow at the New School and founding CEO of Global Moments. Her new book, A New Global Agenda, Priorities, Practices, and Pathways of the International Community. Diana, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, I'm very happy to be here. And let me show your new book. <laughs> it's a very yes. impressive book, and I hope I've got it tilted right. But it's a very interesting book, and it's certainly one that's going to make us think as to how we've dealt with these issues in the past and what we can do to deal with them in the future. But let's jump right in, well, no, let's don't. Let's hang on for a minute. Let me, I'm really fascinated with your, you're at the, uh, you're at uh, Global Momenta. Yes. What is Global Momenta? That, uh, it's just, it's a very interesting title. Well, thank you. So Global Momenta is a consulting firm that I created about 15 years ago that focuses on innovative strategies for social impact. And I work with high impact clients in philanthropy, finance, entrepreneurship, and uh, uh, social good enterprises. The intention with the name Global Momenta was to connect the dots between what I saw as disparate movements that had the momentum for human rights, for public health, for economic development, for climate change, and I saw those as needing to be addressed in an inter interconnected way and recognize that there's a global momenta for okay. these initiatives. Instead of momentum, it's momenta. That's right. Plural. <laughs> okay, That's very right. good. And our viewers can go to globalmomenta.com to get more information on that. Well, let's jump into your book, A New Global Agenda, Priorities, Practices, and Pathways of the International Community. How did this book come about? Why did you decide you wanted to write it? Well, I, I think I decided in part because the book decided I, it needed to be written. It was the, it was, this was the <laughs> okay. book I couldn't not do. Mm -hmm. And it had, it had two uh, origins. The first came from my editing a precursor book, A Global Agenda, Current Issues Before the General Assembly of the United Nations, mm -hmm. that I did first in 2001 with the United Nations Association. And that book focused as the title suggests specifically on the United Nations system and the General Assembly. And when 9-11 happened, a day after the book's publication, I became convinced that uh, as important as the global agenda for the United Nations is, mm -hmm. we also need a human agenda for all of us. 15 years later, 2016, we saw some great global agendas coming about with the Sustainable Development Goals, with the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, with Habitat 3 for uh, the future of urban urbanization and urban centers. Uh, and yet we also saw a backlash of um, resistance to globalization and it became clear to me that the time had come for a new global agenda. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, that was my next question. The old global agenda, how, how does that differ from the new global agenda? It, there were treaties in the past. We didn't have the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Uh, we didn't have the Iran nuclear deal uh, 10 years ago, whatever, we just had it two years mm -hmm. ago. But what was the old agenda versus the new agenda in broad terms? Right, so it, it's not that the old agenda is no longer relevant or there, mm -hmm. it's that we need to broaden both its scope of content and of application. So what does that mean in terms of a new global agenda? We need to reframe that as being something relevant and um, compelling for all of us, not just the international mm -hmm. diplomatic community, but all of us as partners, academics, activists, philanthropists, investors, mothers, fathers, children, the elders, all mm -hmm. of us are the international community. And being more inclusive and diverse in content and contributors uh, was part of how I wanted to reflect that in this book. So we have contributing authors who are not only experts on the United Nations, but who are coming from very different professional perspectives and geographic orientations as well. Mm -hmm. So this international community would, 
we, we need to find that that really is the, the entity that you want to be more inclusive and to be have more involvement. Is that correct? That's right. So the United Nations may well be the epicenter of mm -hmm. multilateral engagement and initiatives. We only have one. So it's right. critical <laughs> and central and, and in that sense quite pivotal. And yet I think today we see and, and we know that we need to expand that circle of influence and practice through partnerships that perhaps are concentric circles fanning out or overlapping circles that, that intersect. So I see the international community as including people involved in business, people involved in the arts, in science, uh, and uh, all of us, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the United Nations, it brings to mind, we've talked about on this program before, how the UN is much broader than what most of us think, myself included. So many people think the UN is nothing but the Security Council, the General Assembly, or peacekeeping, but that's only about 15% of the UN budget, and you've got that whole myriad of UN agencies that are working to provide food for people in Syria or to uh, work with UNICEF to eliminate polio or to help move ships, mail, weather information around the world. Uh, to bring together groups of people to, to hammer out agreements and trade agreements and what have you. And so there's a much broader UN system that impacts our lives every day, is there not? Well, not only is there a much broader system uh, affecting our lives and series of initiatives, uh, multilateral treaties and, mm -hmm. and other uh, instruments, but there's, there's a much broader reality to the way we live on the planet. So we interact with each other in very global ways today through telecommunications, through mm -hmm. globalized medicine and health issues, through uh, uh, business and uh, multi multinational organizations and the way that we are moving throughout the planet. So if we're going to understand the full scope of not only the challenges that we're facing, but the opportunities to address them, we need to be looking more broadly beyond what, as you rightly point out, gets the attention of the Security Council mm -hmm. um, to the, the larger system and I, uh, of the United Nations, and I would say of, of uh, us on the planet. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good point. And the polls show that, I'm not sure, well, I think the ones overseas generally indicate that people who live in other countries know a little more about, or in some cases, much more about the UN than Americans do. But what can we do to help the American public better understand the UN system, its warts and imperfections, as well as the successes, and how it impacts their lives? Are the things that we can do to help inform the public about what the UN is doing and how it's such a vital organization. And as you said, it's the only player in town. It is the one that brings the 193 countries of the UN General Assembly together. But what can we do to help us better understand it? Even though the polls show that Americans generally approve of the UN anywhere from about 45 to about 84% of the time, depending upon the issue. It depends upon what the issue is. But the polls show we do not understand the UN. What can we do differently? Well, I think we can start where we are and recognize that we all have a role to play, that it's not, uh, the work of the UN is not a responsibility that we can afford to, to uh, uh, leave to the diplomats in New York City. We need to each be recognizing ourselves as the partners we are. So that means when it comes to human rights, demonstrating our own uh, sense and practice of tolerance and inclusivity of uh, social justice and respecting dignity of uh, ourselves and the other as, as one of us. Uh, it, it means in terms of climate change, not just looking at leaders who support initiatives like the Paris Agreement on Climate Change to make that difference, but to recognize we all have a part to play. And we make, we, we make choices every single day that determine what that role is. And we're only going to find regenerative solutions and implementation of these agendas and a new global agenda if, if we take uh, action in our own daily lives, all of us. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned a minute ago about the institutions and how they've evolved over the years. When I think back to the UN being formed in 1945, on June 26, 1945, 
basically in the ashes of the Cold War, or, or sorry, World War II. Mm. And the UN was set up to eliminate the scourge of war, to promote economic and social development, and to enhance human rights. We've seen ebbs and flows of those activities over the past 72, 73 years. But it, it, are there events that are happening today that we see that are diminishing some of those uh, lofty goals mm. that we had, such as the promotion of human rights, uh, things like that? Are there things that are happening around the world that we see a decline in democracies and, and that are somewhat alarming? Well, uh, of course, you're, you're, you're asking about both progress and then d alarming trends. And I mm -hmm. think that, that we do have both. Um, but what's so different today than in, when, when the UN was established in the ashes of World War II um, is this sense of globalization and uh, the urgency of our time to address issues we hadn't even anticipated or imagined then. So we did imagine and address issues of refugees as narrowly defined post-World War II. We didn't imagine the scope of forced migration we're seeing around the world today. Um, we didn't imagine the uh, urgency of climate change and the fact that we are now through our human trespass, surpassing planetary boundaries required to sustain human life and facing the threat of systems collapse. This is an uh, uh, unprecedented historic urgency that should be compelling all of us to uh, uh, revisit where we fit into the global agenda. And that's exactly what you've done. You have some really creative and very knowledgeable ed uh, people who are involved in writing these chapters for you in the book. How did you decide to pick these? Did you say, here are the major issues, now I'll find the best expert in this area? Or how did you well, move I, in that direction? Well, I did. I, I did, and I also, um, uh, I, I called on an intergenerational brain trust as a collaborative initiative to inspire and inform me, where do we go from here in terms of crafting a new global agenda? So we looked at the most compelling issues facing people, society, and planet. And in any of those areas, a topic could be reshuffled to look at the societal, planetary, or human dimension. But we, we picked where and how uh, the, uh, the, the topics would be most um, compelling. And so I looked at people prioritizing mm -hmm. legal protection and vulnerable people and essential freedoms. I looked at society prioritizing regenerative development and health and wellness and collaborative leadership. I looked at planet and prioritized uh, resiliency and stability, peacekeeping or peace and, and security. And then in each of those areas, we researched and I thought from my own network and beyond, who is most inspiring uh, with their vision and voice that I want to amplify and I want to place in the context of each other so we can start to see those interconnections, both very established and esteemed experts in their fields and emerging unexpected voices whom I want to uh, bring to the table. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. If you're involved with any type of a PBS or community access TV station, or perhaps you're involved with an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a website and you'd like to share our shows, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service. Today we're taking a look at the, the issues in broad terms of um, economic and social development, war and peace, and human rights, and looking at the old agenda that uh, the countries of the world and international organizations and governments have used, and maybe looking at it in a new way and looking at a new agenda. Today, my guest is going to talk about a very interesting book that she has just published. My guest today is Diana Aiton Schinker, and her new book is A New Global Agenda, Priorities, Practices, and Pathways of the International Community. Diana, let's, let's 
take this apart a little bit. As we go, first part I think we've talked about, but let's look at those three words, priorities, practices, and pathways. Why did you pick those three words and what are examples of how you're achieving them with the book? So uh, I quite consciously chose to look at priorities, practices, and pathways um, as opposed to the old agenda of issues because uh, I want to create a framework and a reframing of an agenda that is dynamic, that's ongoing with challenges that may be yet to come. So the uh, priorities and practices try and identify what is most compelling now and coming up. Um, practices suggest less solutions as fixed definitive answers, um, and rather practices as strategies, as approaches that we can continue to refine and uh, uh, improve in addressing issues as they, as they arise. And pathways to emphasize that w we all have different pathways to address these issues, whether it's through the international legal system, or through education, or through arts, or through science, or through the media. And uh, in our pathways, we need to recognize that we are all part of this practice of, of forwarding the agenda of these priorities. The book, uh, I hope, forwards that because uh, it, it sets the articulation of what those, what those, those are. Mm -hmm. what, what message would you give to our viewers today? How can they be involved? They can buy your book, they can get it from the library, they can read it, they can, I'm sure, will we'll get a tremendous amount of information out of it. What, what could be their role in the future? Is there a call to action? Is, is it just informational, or primarily informational, or all of the above and many, much more? Well, it is informational, but, but more, more than that, it is a call to action. One of the challenges that, that arose in, in pulling together this book and editing uh, the, the project with so many brilliant and uh, uh, gifted, committed uh, contributors was the, the question of arrogance. Who are we to set the <laughs> agenda? Uh, and um, who are we to impose uh, information as the definitive solution. Mm -hmm. And we, we moved from the arrogance of agenda to the audacity of agenda as an invitation, as a call to action to continue to engage with all the contributors, with myself, with the book, with Global Momenta, but with each other as readers and participants in an ongoing dynamic conversation. So I hope that the book will for readers be both a mobilizer and an activator. So it can certainly uh, mobilize and activate investors and philanthropists looking to engage by moving their resources more effectively into advancing a new global agenda. I hope that it will mobilize and activate academics and scholars and students and teachers to explore these ideas more thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. And I hope that it will mobilize and activate policymakers and activists and practitioners to craft our practices more effectively with high impact. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly have a very comprehensive book. It's a very interesting book and it, uh, it covers so many different topics. Everything I think from international trade, economic development, peacekeeping to uh, migration, whatever it may be. Are there any items, given it's uh, sort of an A to mm. Z, are there any items or issues that you didn't include that maybe you would have liked to or might include in your next book? Yes. Uh, well, yes. The, uh, it was really difficult to make the choices <laughs> of imagine. what goes in and, and, what, and what doesn't. Um, so there were some omissions of topics that simply fell by the wayside because of a production schedule. Uh, so there, there were some topics that I would have wanted to include um, and wasn't able to. There were also uh, decisions of scope and strategy that were excluded. So for example, we did not include in this a particular focus on a region or a geographic orientation. Instead, we made the choice to look at the topics included and the issues of the, and priorities of a new global agenda as global, recognizing that 
you can't look at Africa in isolation. Mm -hmm. We are Africa. You can't look at the United States or North America in isolation. We are North America. So uh, there's no geographic um, breakdown, mm -hmm. although there are specific geographic examples that authors chose to cite. There's also a, a, a bias and emphasis towards the terrestrial. That's to say, there's no aerospace, there's no astrophysics, um, there's, no, there's no law of the seas, there's no focus on the oceans as such. Um, that said, as an anthropocentric uh, focused, we see ourselves as advancing the human agenda on Earth in connection and hopefully in increased harmony with the biodiversity we need to survive and to thrive on the planet. Mm -hmm. Now, we had talked earlier about the United Nations being the epicenter of the world, which it is because all 193 countries participate in the UN General Assembly. The UN deals with every issue imaginable. Pick one. It doesn't matter. Poverty, hunger, climate change, just on across the board. What role do you see for the United Nations in the future as far as helping to set this new global agenda and participate in it? Uh, be an active participant in it because there is no other game in town. The UN's the only one as far as doing what the UN does. But what role do you see in that area? And are there structural, are there changes that the UN might want to incorporate in order to play this role? Well, I think that the UN serves as an important and fundamental catalyst. Mm -hmm. So the, the UN, uh, as the only game in town, catalyzes the international community as a whole, not just the member states and the diplomatic community, but all of us in the world sharing this planet to understand as a roadmap where we may be headed. Uh, and recent initiatives, I think, encourage us to more actively pursue our roles as partners with the UN in, in its, its central um, catalytic uh, uh, p position. In particular, looking at the SDGs and the uh, reality that these goals will not be achieved exclusively uh, by and within the UN system. Rather, it's going to take all of us. We see, for the first time to my knowledge in the 17th, goal, a call to action for partnerships. And that's, that's uh, engendering and enabling a, a, a momentum for public-private partnerships to um, carry out the Sustainable Development Goal framework. I think that's very encouraging in a direction we're going to see need to see more and more of to uh, really move forward uh, in, in our planet. Mm -hmm. And of course, you referenced the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals that were adopted in 2015 to run 2016 through 2030. And there are 17 practical logical goals to eradicate hunger, to eradicate poverty, to combat climate change, to empower women and girls. Uh, and there are about 13 more <laughs> that I won't get into at this point. But uh, this, these sustainable development goals are goals that virtually almost every organization in the world, uh, every religious group, and many are right now, rallying around them, uh, Rotary, um, Lions, Kiwanis International Service Clubs, religious groups are involved in helping to achieve them. But they're really sort of the, the parameters, are they not? They're, not, they're the uh, sort of the uh, foundation of what we need to be focusing on for the next 14 years to help bring about this, uh, to create a better world, and to develop this new agenda. And it, a couple of things are really exciting to me about that. One is that the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, are, uh, are, are uh, mobilizing partners we hadn't seen before mm -hmm. and to an extent we hadn't seen before. So I'm starting to see and hear from private finance, investment firms saying we're SDG aligned or we're SDG focused. I'm starting to see that in philanthropic platforms and philanthropic families and foundations. I'm starting to see that in uh, organizations that may have wanted to be involved on global issues but didn't really have a point of entry. The SDGs are giving us that point of entry. So that's really exciting. Another part of the SDGs that I think 
is uh, important for us to recognize is how inherently interconnected they are. So you mentioned the, the goal to empower girls and women. That cuts across every single goal. You can't have uh, economic development, you can't have peace, you can't have effective climate change, you can't have um, uh, health and wellness without empowering girls and women. Similarly, the uh, uh, third SDG to um, uh, create health, you can't have universal access to health without having economic development, without having uh, climate change and the stability that that, that, that brings. So uh, that, that recognition that's built into the structure of the SDGs is, I think, very promising as an indication of where we're headed and where we need to be. Mm -hmm. Well, Diana Eaton, Schenker, you've given us a lot of food for thought, a lot of good ideas, a lot of practical solutions. I want to thank you so very much for a thank very you. interesting and a very informative program. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.